Hi, my name is Ivy Starnes and I'm a gated horse trainer in Fort Worth, Texas. Today is part two of, of at least right now, a four part series. Uh, part one I did a few months back talking about fear in horses. And there was so much interest in getting more information about fear and how to train through it on the trail that I decided to do more. But when I looked at the comments and what people needed addressed and how big of a topic this was, it's going to be three more parts. So this is part two, tomorrow's part three, and then part four. And if I need to, I will add on other parts. Talking about fear in horses, how do you deal with it? How do you prep for it? Uh, this is going to be a video, this series of videos is going to be heavily focused on equine behavior and using positive reinforcement to help the horse be brave. A lot of you, no, some of you may not want to try this method and that's okay. I'm going to try to say this in every video. There are things you can do other than feeding treats, like letting the horse stop and take a break, giving him scratches, but the biggest motivator and reinforcer that we currently have in our repertoire is food. This is one of the horse's strongest motivators. And if you actually think about how horses are around food, it makes complete sense. So we are going to be talking about that um, before I get into it. So this week is like recognizing fear in horses. Um, I want to read you uh, a couple of just fun stories and I'll address them more tomorrow. But I went on one of my favorite groups, Empowered Equestrians, and asked the question about well, how do you address your horse spooking suddenly or getting afraid on the trail? Because that is something that people had asked in the previous video. And so there were some very, very fun answers. And so I want to go ahead and share a couple of those stories with you and then get into it. So one of them, uh, this lady, Rosie, and she said I could share her story. So uh, account, because it's not a story, it's real. I'm just going to read what she says here. So uh, again, this is addressing what do you do if you're on the trail, or you're out and your horse suddenly gets nervous? Um, what do you address? So she said, I found that when you have a pony who trusts you, who knows you will never deliberately ask too much of them, that these crisis moments occur less anyway. I've had a few instances when my youngster where she wanted to panic or had suddenly gone over threshold, but just a click is enough to halt her in her tracks and bring her back to a thinking brain. Another bonus is that she's so used to me using food to reassure her for things that I can't control. Now, I love this part of the story. She says that when we fell in a bog and she started to panic be, uh, because she was in well over knee deep, instead she noticed the grass that was right in front of her nose, instantly relaxed, had a bite, then gathered herself calmly and walked out. She says, I swear she assumed it was just another setup and food would be provided to reassure and calm her. But even if that is fanciful thought, even if that is a fanciful thought, it's the fact that we've had so many chances to work through ever increasing challenges. That's important, the ever increasing challenges together. And each time I've been there, when something really happens, it is no more than just another practice. So I love, love, love that account uh, because she shows what I'm going to be talking about is that preparation helps your horse have confidence in you. Again, this for those people that want to, when I say just trail ride, I don't mean that as a bad thing, but for the people who want to have fun and not train, this is going to be difficult. There is no easy fix. What I'm going to be proposing is some, some fun training things and building so your horse trusts you when that happens. But we're going to more about that in tomorrow's video where we're going to talk about how you can work through things at home and increase the uh, difficulty of things. But what I want to talk about now is how to notice fear. So I have a whole bunch of articles. I've talked about this before in Fear Thresholds, but that was like over a year ago or a year and a half, two years ago. So we're going to be addressing this again and talking about fear thresholds. So we're talking about how to recognize fear, talking about horses and their thresholds and trigger stacking. I guess I should have led with that, but that's what we're talking about today. So let's talk about fear. This is an article from equinehelper.com. So not, it's just, you know, has lots and lots of horse info, nothing specific to what I teach. So I'm going to read a quote. So how do horses show fear? 
Depending on the situation, horses can show fear physically as their eyes will widen or they'll get a wrinkle in the eye. Their nostrils will flare and their necks will brace upwards. Sometimes, and this is extreme, horses will physically shake out of fear or chew their bit to help ease their anxiety. Another way horses demonstrate fear is trying to stay as far away from something as they can. A horse that is afraid will have a hard time standing still and calm. I love that last sentence. A horse that is afraid will have a hard time standing still and calm. So let's take a look. There's many situations you might be in where your horse gets afraid. And we need to recognize those fears because rarely, not never, but rarely do horses suddenly spook or suddenly act out. Yes, it does happen. So I want you guys to hear me. It does happen. But usually there is some kind of a buildup of stressors or stimulus or the horse is experiencing pain and these build up. But let's take a look at some fear signals that we can watch for. One of the things we can watch for, uh, or there's several things, they're all, and your horse can be different. A high head means your horse is not calm and relaxed. Pretty much, period. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't ride your horse with their head up ever, but it means they are not calm and relaxed. Will your horse stop and stand? If they won't, your horse is not calm and relaxed. Is your horse's eye wide? Is there a wrinkle in the corner of their eye? If there is, your horse is not calm and relaxed. If your horse is breathing fast or doing lots of uh, blinking, your horse is not calm and relaxed. If th Those are some basics some very, very basics, but a lot of people want to ignore those signs. So there was a, so, um, there was an article, um, and it talked about how you can ignore the little things. Oh, here, here's a, five means stress. Um, Here's an interesting, this is uh, the veterinary nurse. Uh, so this is just an article about uh, horses and ponies and donkeys and just signs, and I'll share a link. So here's species, so this is horses and ponies, behaviors indicative of stress and distress. And then they cite research as well. But I'm just gonna go through and read the list and you can look at the link and do the research if you want. Ears pinned back, raised head, head tossing and shaking, tail swishing, increased defecation, marked eyebrow wrinkles, increased spontaneous eye blink rate, increased eye temperature, which again, most of us aren't gonna be able to know that, increased reward sensitivity, positively correlated with increased anticipatory behavior. I guess that's gonna be food arousal. Um, reactive behavior towards novel objects, explosive behavior during handling, unresponsiveness to tactile stimulation or persons entering the stable, Basically, when the horse is so focused on something else, it doesn't react to other more mild things, I think. Withdrawn posture, stiff neck, limited ear, eye movement, fixed gaze. We've all seen that where the nose goes up and they're staring at something. And stereotypies, which is cribbing, weaving, fencing, pace, fence pacing, which could be um, habit or stressors. Uh, so I just wanted to read another a list of fear behaviors. Okay. Um... This is trigger stacking article. Okay, let's, let's, okay, so those are some fear signals. And the reason it's super important to address these is because people ignore them. So let's say you're on a trail ride. Let's say you start out and your horse is calm, he's walking, he's relaxed. Um, and, and from there, your horse was calm, relaxed, and then he spooked. Okay, so that is kind of out of the blue. But what is more likely to occur is that your horse will have the head up. Uh, they'll be more anxious, they'll be more forward, they'll be more breathing, uh, their tail may be raised or clamped if they're afraid or if there's stressors, and then a small stressor could make the horse jump or get scared. Another account that I heard was a horse was probably taken to a competition too early, it was a trail competition, and the horse was already nervous, you could just see. The rider got on, the horse is nervous, high-headed, nostrils flared, and and there was windy, it was very windy out. Um, so we take a horse to a brand new environment, which is a competition that's at least one stressor, if not a bunch. Then it was windy out, and we all know that is a big stressor for horses. On top of that, um, so those are two major stressors alone, wind and a competition and competitive uh, anxiety, and I don't know, windy and competitive, uh, the emotions. 
And then the rider went to get something out of her pocket and a Kleenex blew out of her pocket and the horse spooked and the rider got hurt. Now, did the horse spook at the uh, Kleenex blowing out of the pocket? Or was it a combination of things that caused the horse to spook? Do you need to go now make sure the Kleenexes are okay? No, this horse showed he was stressed and fearful and the rider should have done things to de-escalate. Cheryl says, pumpkin, triangle-shaped eyes, not rounded and relaxed. Yes. Chrissy says, is anxiety always related to being fearful? Not necessarily fearful, but anxiety, I believe, is always related to stress. And stress always is releasing cortisol and adrenaline in the horse's body, which is the opposite of calm and relaxed. Not necessarily fearful, but anxiety is part of trigger stacking. So even if your horse isn't afraid, if there's anxiety about things, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and actually it's a good idea. So in the veterinary nurse, they talk about uh, how different things can be stressful. And here's an interesting thing. The article basically starts out with the horse has five needs and these needs need to be fulfilled. A need for a suitable environment, a need for a suitable diet, the need to be, ab ex be able to exhibit normal behavior patterns such as eating, laying down, rolling, interacting with other horses, any need that has to be housed with or apart from other animals, need to be protected from pain, suffering, injury, disease. Uh, and I would put in there, which it didn't specifically include, is that it needs to be with other equine animals and the emotional needs of the herd. And these things need to be addressed. So if your horse doesn't have a suitable diet, doesn't have suitable turnout, has pain anywhere, those are already triggers. Those are already stimulus that is putting your horse closer and closer to reacting. Now let's talk about reacting. Let me find, um, where, okay. All right. So this is another article from Willing Equine. I've shared it before and it is called the, uh, uh, what and why fear thresholds. So, the threshold scale is a place where the horse is calm. So under threshold is safe zone, ideally where you always want your horse to be, especially when training and handling, okay? Um, threshold is caution. Just under the threshold, the horse has recognized the presence of a stimulus that could be considered frightening. And then over threshold is danger. This is the level at which the horse is reacting through fight or flight to a stimulus that it finds frightening. Now this doesn't count trigger stacking, this is just thresholds. So stimulus and the definition is something that rouses or incites activity, an object or event that is apprehended by the senses, something the horse notices, something that stimulates or acts as an incentive, any drug, agent, electrical impulse or other factor to cause a response in an organism. That's a very technical definition. Uh, and then she talks about fight or flight, and then she says, what is a fear threshold? So threshold is a point at which a physiological or psychological effect begins to be produced as a high threshold for pain, or, uh, or quote, has a high threshold for pain. A level, point, or value above which something is true or will take place, and below which will not. So to quote her, when we add in the word fear, the definition of fear threshold is the point at which a stimulus is at a strong enough intensity to cause a negative or fearful reaction. There are also other thresholds such as emotional threshold, uh, stress threshold, pain threshold, stimulus threshold, which are not related to fear. So like Chrissy was asking, is, is anxiety always fear? No, because it could be stress, pain, stimulus, uh, 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 stimulus would be uh, temperature change, the body. Quote, however, when dealing with animals that are instinctively fearful creatures, fear is the most common threshold we need to be aware of and need to understand in order to be effective trainers and handlers. Now, this whole article is amazing and you guys should go read it. Um, so I just talked about the threshold stages. How does a horse communicate its fear threshold? To quote her, unlike humans, horses are cannot simply open their mouths and tell you they're afraid. They can admit they can't admit they're afraid of the dark or that they have a fear of heights. Instead, as responsible horse people, we need to listen to how our horses do tell us what they are afraid of, which is through body language. 
I'm going to talk about each level and show you relevant pictures of horses expressing the level of body language. Okay, she's talking about that. Uh, so, quote, staying on a threshold can be easier for some horses than others. Genetics, how they were raised, of course. Either way, the signs of a horse under threshold are pretty straightforward. Relaxed and calm is when a horse under threshold looks like natural or low head carriage, relaxed muscles, steady breathing, relaxed, fa relaxed facial features, relaxed happy ears, soft eyes, and so on. Um, when a horse has reached an escalated, or so this is the important part really, recognizing when a horse is at threshold may be a little harder. It can vary from horse to horse. This is where getting to know the individual horse you're working with is very critical. But general signs might include being hesitant to move, freezing, muscles beginning to tense, a cocked back leg, elevated head, rigid forward ears or rapid ear movement, hesitation to eat, slightly uneven or increased breath rate, slight heart rate increase, muscle twitches, shortened gaits movement, lack of awareness for handler and more. When a horse has reached this stage, it's often up to the handler whether the situation escalates or de-escalates. I love that. Let me read that again. When a horse has reached the stage where they're at threshold, it is often up to the handler whether the situation escalates or de-escalates. And this is where you come in. The issue is when your horse gets to the point where they're at threshold, what do you do? Now, many trainers say you work through it, you push the horse forward, work, make them work when they're upset, where they're upset, if they want to be by the barn, make them work there. I mean, there's, there's lots of, of examples. Uh, but what I want to talk about is prepping. Tomorrow we're going to really talk about prepping and how to de-escalate. Okay, and that's what on this one page, there's all these stories or accounts um, where horses started to get at threshold or above threshold and the owners went back to basics, got their horse back under threshold, back to the relaxed calm and then continued on. What I'm saying is that I feel like many, many riders are pushed or they believe that it's their job to continue on when the horse is stressed. Now, let us say this. There are times when your horse may be stressed or worried about something, but you know your horse really well and you know your horse can walk past this, be a little bit stressed and walk past it and he's going to relax. And that is completely fine. I'm not saying not to do that. What I'm saying is those people that tell me like, oh, well, my horse sees a horse up ahead. He gets really stressed. And I'm like, well, what are you doing to deescalate the situation? What do you do when your horse is out on the trail and he sees something nervous? Is your whole goal now to make him do circles and spin? Or do you have other methods of getting the horse back under threshold? Because again, during training, the goal is to keep them under threshold. Okay, we will move on. Uh, and again, you can read that article, uh, The Willing Equine, and the link is in the description. Uh, and she shows photos of horses over or approaching threshold. And I like this. So she continues on, why does it matter? Other than the facts that a frightened thousand pound animal is not necessarily safe to be on or around. Who has been knocked over by a horse or had a horse run away? Not good. A horse's mental state, whether it's relaxed or afraid, has a strong impact on its ability to learn or how it learns. To be effective and humane trainers, we must be very aware of the mental state our horses are in. If you don't read the research and just hear my translation, skip to the italics. Uh, skip. So then she has she lists a bunch of research, which you can read if you want. But I'm going to skip. So basically, this is what she says. Basically, when a horse is confronted with a situation or stimulus they instinctively respond to as dangerous, their bodies start dumping hormones that allow them to respond effectively to a threat. One of those hormones is a stress hormone, cortisol. Cortisol can both help commit a scene, action, or event memory, helping the animal learn to stay alive through called fear learning, or uh, is it implicit learning? No, not implicit. It's the other one. I haven't, I, I will do an article on that at some point. Or an excessive amount of it can actually prevent memory retention and the ability to learn. That's too much cortisol can do that. This is excessive, this excessive level of cortisol can prevent the unlearning of a fear reaction to a stimulus or the process of learning anything new at all. To put simply, when a horse is presented with something we don't want them to fear, let's say a blanket, and they go above a threshold when we present the stimulus, the blanket, they are far more likely to respond fearfully to the stimulus in the future than they were before their body produced the cortisol, basically. 
And it goes on. She has such really, really great things to say here, um, including a bunch of research, if you want proof, of the fact that when horses are presented with a stimulus, which is neither good nor bad, and it becomes a fearful stimulus, and so their body dumps cortisol, at this point, their reaction to it next time is most likely going to be fearful than if instead of making it stressful, we keep the horses under threshold. <coughs> okay. All right, let's continue on. I really like that article. Uh, we talked about that. Okay, let's talk about trigger stacking. I've talked about it before and shared lots of articles, so this might be familiar. <clears throat> Trigger stacking, this is a quote from Megan Simpson Equestrian, uh, and the link is in the description. Trigger stacking is the buildup of multiple stressors or stimulus that occurs at the same time or close together, resulting in the horse's fight or flight response being activated. The resulting behavior can be expressed as bucking, bolting, rearing, kicking, biting, for example, or a combination of unwanted behaviors. I would also like to include this means a horse won't stand still, they paw, they knock the handler over, they stand and stare. So uh, not just running and bolting, but also freezing or balking. The horse, however, is simply expressing itself in a way completely appropriate to how they are feeling. So here's her example. For example, you take your horse in from the field to go for a ride. It's raining and a bit windy. No one on the yard has time to accompany you on today's hack, so you go out alone. Your horse's back is a bit damp from being without a rug, but it's a one-off so you don't think you'll mind. You're riding along the track and you pass by a dog walker whose dog barks suddenly at your horse. Your horse suddenly overwhelmed then takes off down the track bucking as he goes. To the rider, this is very important, to the rider may seem like the dog caused this extreme reaction. However, the dog was the last straw. Had it not, had there not been other triggers in the buildup or fewer stressors, then this behavior may not have been exhibited at all or not been as severe. The horse simply got to the point where he could no longer deal with everything that was happening to him. Firstly, there was rain and wind. <clears throat> Even the removal of the horse from his field mix can be counted as a stressor, and it usually is. Then there was a lack of equine companion on the hack, the discomfort of having the saddle put on a wet back, and lastly, the barking dog, which was the final trigger. The horse's threshold had been reached. Just like a human having a bad day at the office and one more thing going wrong, a meltdown occurred. All right, that's trigger stacking. Let's take a look at a, this here. So this is trigger stacking, specifically for horses. So you have improper saddle fit or anything that can cause pain, ulcers, EPM, Lyme disease, a sore leg, <clears throat> the horses had a bad night, being ridden away from home, an unbalanced rider. You put all those things together. And if an improper saddle fit and being away from home were done with a balanced rider, you would have stayed below threshold. If being ridden away from home an unbalanced rider was not combined with pain, you would have stayed under threshold. But you can see here that the horse goes over threshold with all of these things together. And if you Google trigger stacking, there are many, many things. If you're really interested in this, I shared a link in the description, which is a YouTube video. Um, it's not like a super professionally done video, but her examples and talk of trigger stacking is beautiful and lovely. It's a long video. You probably can pretty much listen to it on a car ride. It's really, really good. I highly recommend everybody listen to it. Um, okay, so I like this. Continuing on the same blog, Megan Simpson Equestrian, the link is in the description. She says, <clears throat> under the headline, what can you do to prevent trigger stacking? You'll want to start being more of aware of potential stressors. These can be unique to the individual horse. Things like plastic bags blowing, umbrellas, dogs. Stressors can come in the form of lack of forage, lack of turnout, or being restricted from engagement in social activities, meaning with other horses. Poorly fitting tack, too much pressure, lack of understanding can also lead to triggers. Even you as the rider handler can be a trigger. Getting angry at a horse or even feeling anxious yourself can be a contributing factor. And let's add a few more. <laughs> Cinches that are too tight. Flies, flies around the legs, feet that are hurting, uh, horses whinnying, just general activity, the emotion level of the area around you. Then she continues, watch your horse. Increase your awareness of equine body language so you can more easily read signs of stress. This will help you identify triggers in the buildup of a potential outburst. Then you can begin to deal with the triggers themselves. Okay, and then she goes on, and then we're going to talk more about this tomorrow when we talk about what you can do at home. Um, and 
Regina Happ says, I have a mare that colics when she gets too stressed. Yeah, that's really common. It's why horses can colic at a show is it's combined with different feed, different water, stressors, not drinking enough, and their bodies can get really tight and tense and that can trigger colic. All right, let's take a look at this other one. So this one is from, uh, I don't remember which one this was, which, um, I'll have to, I, think get the link. I think I have the link in the description. So this is progression of equine fear. Now, in her description, she says this is dependent. Every horse is different, so be aware of that. Uh, but these are general signs. So step one, subtle signs. Slow blinking, yawning, dry licking and chewing, tense lips, muzzle face, whale white of the eye. Do you know what those look like? If you don't, go study. Step two, slightly stronger signs. Turns head away, neck shake, rub face on a leg, sniffing the ground, decreased appetite. Meaning when you offer food, they're not interested. Sniffing the ground, they're trying to calm themselves. Step three, subtle body language. These are the subtle signs versus the strong signs. So subtle body language is licking or biting objects, high head, cocked hind leg, tense body, snatching grazing. So not just grazing and putting the head down and eating, but taking a bite and throwing the head back up. Tucked tail, flare nostrils. Now the strong body language could be a tail swish, raised tail, pinned ears. They walk away if they're loose and able, showing their flank, pawing, rolling. Now we get to fear behavior. Nose blow snort. We all know what that sounds like. Vocalizing, whinnying, running, rearing, kick threat, bite threat. Now these are obviously extreme, but so many times we ignore all of those other behaviors. And when we get to the fear behavior, we think it happens suddenly. Then the fight, the flight, fight, freeze, fawn, fidget, defecate. Acute stress response, hyperarousal related to survival mode. When you start having these, it means you're in trouble and you went too far and it's your job to de-escalate as quickly as possible or risk getting hurt. Prevention. Learn to understand the horse's thresholds and read the early signs to prevent escalation. Fear behavior. Change our behavior, the environment, lower our expectations, review our training plans to avoid the progression of fear responses. And then she continues, because every horse is different. Every equine is an in individual. They have unique experience of life, their environment, history, and human caretakers. This is only a guide. Therefore, observing and knowing your individual animal's typical behavior and context is essential in using this guide. This is from whisperinghorse.com.au. And the link to her article and the image here is in the description. So again, you'll notice that so many of these articles that I'm reading are talking about learning the body language <clears throat> and de-escalating. We're going to talk tomorrow more about de-escalating. Uh, I keep saying, oh, I don't mean to. Uh, trigger stacking, we did that. Okay, so I think there's one more article I want to talk about. Uh, and then there's just another examples of more trigger stacking. Um, fear in horses is... Fear or stress can add up to a big reaction. Now, I am very aware that sometimes the horse doesn't give you warning. But in many of the accounts that people are coming to me with, there is warning. They just don't want to do, do the things to de-escalate. I was interesting because I was talking to a lady who does a lot of quarter horses, but also she's done work with many breeds. And I was saying that um, when the horse doesn't want to stand still, the last thing that I do with gated horses is spin circles, whether on the ground or under saddle, because this usually gets them more worked up. And my goal is actually to de-escalate, not to increase the escalation and increase the cortisol and the stress. And she was like, huh, never thought about that. And the thing is, quarter horses, as a general rule, it's a generalization, they tend to give up easier. Gated horses get more hyped up and we want to avoid this. That's my whole goal. Nose blow snort study was done showing that happy horses nose blow, not dragon snort, but the other kind. Yes. So Chrissy comments. Uh, so yes, I've been around horses that just blow and it's, it's good. But I think people that have had a horse that does the, that's stress. That's the horse being stressed. I know because I had some and when I've ridden them, it's not the, it's not the rhythmic snorting that happens when they're moving or cantering. It's the head up nose out, and then they blow. That is a sign of heightened emotional stress, not a playful snort. Um, so there is a difference. And I think most people that have been around that horse that gets really upset, they'll know the difference. So the trick is that what we want is 
we want to keep your horse on the threshold and I want to encourage you, read the articles, start reading about body language, watch your horse. If your horse's head comes up, that means there's some level of stress. Does it mean they're terrified? No, but there is level of stress. If your horse never puts their head down, it's indicative of the fact that your horse is stressed or your saddle doesn't fit is the two biggest things. Uh, also take a look at bit fitting, but on the ground, if your horse's head is up all the time, that means they're stressed. And if you get on that horse with the head up, you are asking for something to happen. Now, I don't mean that in a bad way, like you guys are all idiots and if your horse does something, you deserve it. What I mean is your horse is literally communicating in the only way possible that they're already upset about something. And it's up to you to listen. Tomorrow we're going to talk about how to de-escalate the situation and also read some more accounts of people who have done this and we're going to bring in more positive reinforcement. I don't have a great video examples, but I have a lot of good articles to share with you and I'll be doing a little bit with my own horses and sharing those videos. So tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, we're going to be talking about what to do at home to prep your horse for when they get nervous on the trail. And then, <clears throat> of course, I forgot what we're doing uh, is out on the trail, how to, how to take that on the trail and take those techniques you've worked on at home and help your horse de-escalate on the trail. So I hope this has helped you. I know this is not always a super interesting article, um, but it's important. Sue says, is de-escalation tomorrow? Uh, some of it's tomorrow uh, and some of it will be for on the trail. It will be on Thursday. What you said about quarter horses versus gated and circles was life changing. <laughs> I'm so glad. Jill says, circles don't work with my American Saddlebred. Like you said, it makes the situation worse. Now, yeah, Jill and Sue. Circles, I know because so many people have gone to quarter horse people and they have a lot of good things, but quarter horses literally will give up. And Arabians and gated horses of all breeds generally tend to get more hyped up by doing circles. So I never, ever prescribe circles to get them tired or get them worn out on the ground or under saddle because I found with gated horses, it doesn't work. You will get tired and dizzy and fall off your horse before your horse changes their mind. So definitely be aware that that is not what I would recommend to de-escalate. De-escalating is bringing the stress down, not adding stress. Okay, so tune in tomorrow and Thursday. And again, if you don't tune in, you can always watch the videos later. Thank you guys so much for watching. I love the questions. Let me know if you have any good resources or good accounts, what you've done to de-escalate the situation. And I will see you guys tomorrow. You guys, you got this.